Hi guys, we're going to talk about injections and we're really going to look at the safety concerns that are associated with injections. During lab, we'll get the chance to practice these safety concerns so that we, when we are administering injections safely, um, we want to remember um, all of these different components. We also want to remember that injections are a medication, so we want to follow our six rights. So we'll talk about doing our three safety checks followed by our six rights with each administration. So let's get started here. So these are all the different types of injections, and we're really just gonna focus on the top three, subcutaneous injections, intramuscular, and intradermal. So the first thing we have to think about when we're giving our injections is making sure that we have all of the equipment that we need. We need to make sure we know the route of administration. So we're going to go to the physician's orders, we're going to check the recommended route, and then we're going to go to the MAR and see which route am I going to be administering the medication. And then remembering if I give my medication in the wrong route, it could cause harm to my patient. So a good example of this might be um, that you meant to give it into the muscle, but you didn't quite get there and you only got it in the subcutaneous tissue. So the absorption may be much slower as opposed to if you had used a much longer needle, gotten it into the muscle, and then the absorption would have been much quicker. We also need to think about the viscosity of the solution. So when I say viscosity, that's the thickness of the solution. So a good example for this one is Ativan. That's a very common medication. It is very viscous or thick. So when you're thinking about what needle to use, if you use a small needle, that won't be able to handle the thickness of the medication. So thinking about using a bigger gauge needle. And then what is the quantity to be administered? So each location, whether that be dermal, subcutaneous, or muscle, can only tolerate a certain amount of solution. So knowing how much each area can tolerate is important because if you're needing to give more than what they can, what that space can tolerate, you'll have to think about doing something differently. And then what is our patient's body size? There's a big difference in giving injections to a 90 pound patient versus a 200 pound patient. A short needle may reach the muscle in a very thin patient, where in a large patient, you're gonna need a longer needle. And then again, the type of medication. Some med medications are damaging to tissues, so making sure we're familiar with those medications that could damage our patient's tissues and that we aren't giving those medications that could cause any harm. So let's look at the different parts of needles. In lab, we'll break out some needles and we'll look at these really close. The hub is what screws into the lure lock of the syringe. The shaft of the needle, you can see that there, connects right into the hub. And then the last part is the bevel. You will hear people talking about turning the bevel up. This will help us give our medications with less pain or discomfort. That bevel creates a narrow slit when injected into the tissue. If you use a long, sharp, narrow bevel, it's gonna cause less pain for our patient, which is ultimately our goal. It also has less leaking of medication when you pull the needle back. So we want to think about that when we're giving our injection. Small needle, long bevel, because it's going to be less painful for our patient. Most of these needles will come prepackaged with a syringe, but sometimes they come individually packaged, and that does allow you to choose a different needle in size or gauge with that. The next thing we need to look at is the um, different gauges of needles or how big the needle is. So it's important to note um, the large, larger the gauge, the smaller the needle. So just looking at this picture here on this slide, you can see um, that the larger the gauge, the smaller the needle. 
So you can see on the left of the picture, if you have a 27 gauge needle, it's a very small thin needle, one that you might use for an intradermal injection. Where on the right side of the picture, you have an 18 gauge needle. It's much larger and you would use that maybe for an intramuscular injection or drawing blood. This one will cause a lot more discomfort because it's a much bigger needle than those on the left side of the picture. So making sure you understand this concept, a big number gauge is a small needle. Okay, so let's talk about what we need for the different types of injections. When we're thinking about our intradermal injections, these are the ones that are just right under the skin. So we're gonna use a small needle, a 25 to 27 gauge. I think ATI says 26 or 27. Each hospital, again, is going to vary. Just remember you want a really small one for this injection. Needle length is also important. So from the hub to the end of the needle is the length of the needle. So for intradermal, you would want a very small needle length also for that one. So that says half to three-eighths of an inch. For subcutaneous, you can see that the gauge is similar to our intradermal but not much different. Um, we do need to remember we will um, use a small needle. Um, large needles are just gonna cause pain. The needle length is also very similar because we know that the subcutaneous or adipose tissue is just below the dermis. And so we only need a short needle to get into that tissue. Intramuscular, we're gonna need a larger gauge needle. And this is also where we're gonna think about the viscosity of the medication and how much tissue you're gonna to need to get through to get to that muscle. So you may use a 18 gauge versus a 25 gauge if the medication is thick. You don't want the needle to bend on the way in, so length depends on your patient. So really looking at your patient. The average healthy adult will need a one to one and a half inch. If you have a more obese patient, you may need a one and a half to two inch needle. You could use a, a one up to three inches in a very morbidly obese patient or a patient that may weigh over 300 pounds. You may have to consider other methods um, if you're having trouble getting to that muscle due to all the subcutaneous tissue. So now let's look at each of the angles that we're going to give these injections. So this slide shows a great picture of the angles of each needle, and it's easy to see why I would need to use a different angle to get into the appropriate tissue, depending on the order from the physician. So the tip of the needle needs to be in the location where I want to give it. So for intradermal, just below the upper layers of the skin, we're gonna go at a five to 15 degrees. For subcutaneous, again, that's gonna depend on the size of our patient. Small patients may be 45 degrees. Larger patients, you may still be able to go in at a 90 degree angle. For our intramuscular, you're pretty much going in at a 90 degree angle to get into that muscle. You're gonna to need to get into that muscle in order for the medication to absorb correctly. When we're drawing from a vial, we want to make sure we're safe. One of the biggest risks for nurses in the healthcare setting is needle sticks, accidental needle sticks. Unfortunately, that exposure to those bloodborne pathogens is on the deadliest hazards, one of the deadliest hazards that we face. Most needle sticks are preventable if we use the right safety devices. The Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act mandates that we do this. So you actually won't find any needles in the hospital that don't have some type of safety mechanisms mandated. The accidental stick comes when we don't use the safety mechanism correctly. So I want you to say this several times today. I will always put my safety device on. So you've given your medication. Now, the number one thing to do right at this point is to activate your safety device, knowing that there's going to be a bunch of other things you're going to want to do. If your patient's bleeding, you'll want to put a Band-Aid on it. You'll want to grab a cotton ball. Let them bleed. 
um, you need to activate that safety device so that no one gets hurt. Not only are you at risk, but your patient could be at risk or even family members. There are just so many things that could be risky. So activate that device is essential. And we will definitely practice this in lab this week. Another thing we wanna consider is to throw it into the sharps container immediately. Put the safety device on and then put it in the sharps container. Use one hand to put the needle away. Never reach down in the sharps container. Don't try to shove or poke anything down in the container. Um, sharps containers are very easy to locate. They are on the wall in every room, usually by the patient's bedside, so that you have easy access to them. You'll also find them in meds rooms um, and in other different locations of the hospital. Once that sharps container gets full, it needs to be changed. Don't keep trying to shove things down in there um, because there's a little more space. Um, that's when risks happen. So when it gets full, make sure you change it. So let's go back and talk about um, some intramuscular injections. Um, this again is where we are delivering medications through the skin and the subcutaneous tissue into that muscle. Remember this has the faster absorption rate than subcutaneous, but it does come with more risks. So stop and think, does the patient really need this medication in the muscle or is there a different route that would work better? Vaccines are about the only thing you give in the muscle anymore. Some antibiotics are still given, but we really try to avoid this method because it is so painful for our patient after the injection. So we want to make sure we get the appropriate needle length based on our patient size. We get the appropriate gauge based on the viscosity of the medication and how deep we give it may need to be a heavier gauge if it needs to pass through a lot of that subcutaneous tissue in order to penetrate those deep muscles. And then making sure we have the appropriate amount. A normal healthy adult can handle up to five mLs of medication into one muscle without much pain or discomfort. Those large volumes of medications don't absorb well, and so we really recommend never giving more than about three mLs of medication into those muscles. Um, you can see in children there, um, you don't want to give more than two mLs. And then in smaller children, it's only one. Even infants can go down to half a mL. So these are the different sites we'll be giving our IM injections. Um, I do want to mention that we are not giving dorsogluteal site any longer. That is not recommended as of about 10 years ago. Evidence just showed that it wasn't safe because of the location of the nerves. It was too easy for nurses to accidentally get the tip of the needle into one of those nerve roots and cause undue pain and possibly permanent damage. Um, so we won't talk about that one. We'll focus on those top three, knowing that dorsogluteal is no longer recommended. So ventrogluteal is the preferred site for adults and adolescents for our IM injections up to about three mils. Um, and we will look at this in lab. The vastus lateralis is the best location and typically the preferred site um, for our patients that are less than one year of age. Um, they can handle about one mil volume. Average adult or adolescents can take up to three mil volumes, and then we're gonna use an 18 to 25 gauge needle, depending on the viscosity of the solution. If it's just a simple aqueous solution, we might do a 22 to a 27, remembering it's going into that vastus lateralis muscle. And then the deltoid is the last one we'll look at. Um, it has, it's a small muscle mass and can really only handle up to two mLs. You'll you typically use a one to one and a half inch needle, and we typically don't use these in infants or toddlers younger than three. So just as a recap, deltoid, no more than one mL. Vastus lateralis, used in infants up to a year of age and ventrogluteal is a preferred site. Um, it, they can handle the most volume of medication. And then um, how is that location determined? Really depends on the age, the medication type, and what volume we're gonna use. So another thing that we're gonna look at is the Z-Track method. 
What we know is when you insert a needle into the tissue, it leaves a very small hole or a track. Small amounts of medication can sometimes leak backwards through this track and be absorbed into other tissues. So we'll use the z track method when we're giving our IM injections. So when we think about the z track, we're gonna pull that skin and tissue before we inject, causing the needle track to take the shape of the letter Z, which gives the procedure its name. This zigzag track line is what prevents medication from leaking from the muscle into surrounding tissues. So when done properly, z track methods disrupt the path and medication can't seep back out. So a good example of this, um, using this method is with iron. Iron has a deep purple color, and if it leaks into the subcutaneous tissue, it can cause discoloration of the skin, like the patient has a bruise. Or if the medication is very irritating, you don't want to leak that back into our subcutaneous tissue because it could cause damage to the skin. Side effects can include swelling and injection discomfort. However, z track injection, injections are usually less painful than the traditional IM injection. So how do we prepare medications for injection? We'll practice each of these in lab, but if we wanna look at this list, we can prepare, inject, prepare injections from a vial, which is a plastic or glass container with a rubber stopper. It's typically single or multi-dose use. So you can see the different vials here, um, the single dose glass container, um, Vials are plastic, glass, um, sometimes there's powdered medication that's packaged in an airtight and sterile environment. We can look at um, drawing medications from ampules. Again, single use, you're gonna snap off the top of that. We'll use a filter needle to draw up the medication. Pre-filled cartridges or syringes, we'll look at mixing uh, medication into one syringe. Uh, mixing insulin into one syringe, and then reconstituting powdered medications. So powdered medications um, add that reconstitution fluid. So here are your ampules. Again, single dose, glass container. Um, we have to pop off that top um, and then use a filter needle with these. Here's our pre-filled single dose syringe. Um, this is again is a one-time use and then you discard it so this will come up from the pharmacy um, typically uh, like vaccines are one-time use and it's already pre-filled um, if you don't need all of the medication then you'll just discard any extra medication before giving it to your patient all right intradermal injections this is the next way we're going to talk about giving medications remembering that this is the slowest absorption rate this is why they perform a tb test and allergy testing in this form because we don't want the patient to absorb those quickly if they were absorbed quickly they could have a systemic reaction and we don't want that so it's important that we get these right under the dermis you won't do these very often unless you work in the community um, and you're doing TB testing. So you don't typically see these very often. But please note the amount that can be given. 0 0.5 is the max you will give. And most of the time it's even less than that. All of the medication goes in a tiny wheel just under the skin and then so that none of it seeps out. So having the bevel up for this one specifically is gonna allow for that little bleb or that little wheel that you see when you get your TB testing. Subcutaneous is um, another injection that will be pretty familiar for you once you start giving these. This is the one you're gonna give frequently because it's how we give insulin. Um, we're gonna administer into the adipose tissue, which is just that layer below the epidermis and the dermis. So you can see here, there's lots of sites that we can give subcutaneous injections. Um, with all of these sites, we're looking for that collection of fat tissue. Most of us have a lot of those, but we don't, but we do know there are certain areas in the body that have more. So our upper thigh, back of the arm, the abdomen, all have an in 
increased amount of adipose tissue, which will help us not accidentally get into our muscle. With subcutaneous, um, it does absorb a little slower than the muscle. So we're gonna educate our patient to rotate their sites. Um, they're gonna find a favorite site, but we need to make sure we're educating them to change sites so they don't damage that adipose tissue or leave bruising. So with their, if they have a favorite site, at least recommend them to go about two inches from that previous site and rotate around to different locations. Subcutaneous can only absorb about one ml of volume, so making sure we don't give too much. If we have more than 1.5 to give, we may need to give that separately into two different injections. So different complications that we can consider or um, have to think about when we give our IM injections, and that is um, the complications, right? We can give a little abscess. Um, if we are cellulitis, um, these are, so for our more obese patients, making sure we're using a larger needle. Um, we could injure the blood vessel, bones or nerves. Um, they could have lingering pain um, or tissue necrosis. So possible complications if we don't give these correctly. So it's really important to make sure we're giving those IM injections correctly. Okay, let's talk a little bit about insulin pre preparation. Um, this is another thing we'll work on in lab, but this is something you need to be familiar with. Um, I'm sure you have discussed insulin in your farm class, how to give it, you understand the principles of insulin, um, but what I want you to know is if I if I need to administer insulin, when do I administer it? So your patient got their breakfast tray, you checked their blood sugar, and it was 300. We don't like that, right? So you know you need to give insulin. The question is, when do you give it in relation to when they eat? That is all about the onset. So Novolog states the onset is less than 15 minutes. So if I administer it and they don't eat within 15 minutes, they could have a hypoglycemic episode. So that means when I administer this, they need to start eating within 15 minutes of administration. Now let's look at that versus regular insulin. So again, another common insulin, you have 30 to 60 minutes after administration before they need to eat. So I would never give either one of these insulins if I didn't know their breakfast tray was already there. They're just going, there's just too many things that could go wrong if you give insulin and you don't have food available. So I'd hate to give it, not have something for them to eat, right? Because then I'm gonna put them in a hypoglycemic situation. Another important thing to note about insulin is it is measured in units. So another thing to repeat multiple times today is I will never drop insulin in a syringe that measures milliliters. All insulin is measured in units. So you won't drop insulin in a syringe measured in mils. If your order is to give three units of insulin, that is a very, very small dose. If you inadvertently gave three mils of insulin, that could cause your patient to go into a hypoglycemic crisis, which would be terrible. All insulin syringes have an orange top that is just a reminder for us that it is for insulin and only for insulin, and it's measured in units versus milliliters. So this is what an insulin syringe might look like. These syringes are measured in units. When we think about mixing insulins, there are some important reminders we must remember. We never wanna mix insulin with any other medications. Insulin can only be mixed with um, other insulin. And then we also need to remember the onset of action of insulin, that is important. We wanna make sure that food is available before giving any insulin so our patient doesn't get hypoglycemic. Verify your dose before you give it. 
I would also verify with another nurse before you give it so that the, you don't give the wrong dose. So we will mix some insulins this week. Um, the biggest and most important thing to remember is that you always draw your insulin from clear to cloudy. Clear being your fast acting insulin, such as Humalog or Novolog, to the cloudy insulins or your long acting, such as Humalin or Regular. This clear to cloudy technique allows prevention of contamination. And this slide just shows you the technique. Um, we're going to put air into our cloudy and then air into our clear. We'll draw our clear, then we will draw our cloudy. So just some other basic rules of thumb to keep our patients safe, and we have discussed, discussed these. I just want to review them. Each inject injection route differs based on the type of tissue the medication enters. So remembering to do this safely. Um, before injecting, we want to make sure we um, know the volume of the medication, the characteristics and viscosity or thickness of the medication, and the anatomical structures or the location that we're going to be giving these medications. And then always make sure you give it the right way. So how do we minimize patient discomfort? Um, we wanna minimize as much pain as we can for our patients. And here's just a few suggestions. Using the smallest needle that is suitable. If you could go smaller, then go smaller. That makes it more comfortable. Make sure the needle is a sharp needle. If you've drawn up even one medication, you've made that needle dull. If you put your needle through a hub of a vial, that you have dulled that needle. So change out your needle. Make sure you're selecting the proper site. You can apply topical anesthetic. So in our PEDS patient, that's a norm. Comfort promise for all of our PEDS patients. Some form of comfort is given with every single needle stick. Engage them in some conversation. This is going to help divert or distract them. And then be comfortable with injections. That's going to come with time and practice. So the more time and practice you put into it, the more comfort you're going to feel. When you finish the injections, make sure you do all of the documentation. Remembering that's our sixth right, that we are using all of our patients' rights when we give that injection. You document the name of the medication, the dose, the route, the time, who gave it, where you gave it, and if anything went wrong. If the patient refuses it or there's any others that errors that have happened, you need to document those as well. And then patient teaching, always want to educate our patient on the medication. When it comes to injections, though, we want to talk to them about side effects specific to the injection site. IM injections are going to have pain at that site. They may feel bruised. If it's subcutaneous, they may also have some bruising at the site. So warn them what to expect after you give the injection, and this will allow the patient to feel more comfortable. And that concludes the chapter on injections. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we will chat about it in class. Thanks, guys.